Welcome to the Time Management Podcast with me, your host, Abigail Barnes. I'm a productivity coach, global speaker, time management author, and award-winning entrepreneur on a mission to share the 888 formula with the world and to remind you that it's your time. Leave it to me to bring you new time management tips, tricks, tools, and strategies to introduce you to guests, research, and case studies from around the world, and to give you a simple five-step process you can follow to up-level your productivity, achieve your goals, and create a life that exceeds your wildest dreams. I'm so excited that you're here, so let's get started. Welcome to the show. My guest today is the amazing Esther Fox. Esther, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. So excited for the conversation we're going to have today all about time and other things. You are going to want to stick around for this entire episode today. So make sure wherever you are listening to this, you are ready to be wowed. So Esther, let's just dive straight in. Who is Esther Fox in a nutshell? (laughs) Hi, so um, I'm Esther Fox. I'm a chartered physiotherapist. I also have a PhD in um, exercise therapy, physiotherapy. I live in Devon on Dartmoor and I run a physiotherapy clinic here. Outside of that, my my real love is horses and dogs and farming. I love that we have got Dr. Esther Fox here to give us her insight and wisdom around this conversation. But before we get to that, let's really start off by setting the ground in this conversation. What was your relationship like with time back in the day? That's a really interesting question. From as long as I can remember ago, I've always felt I've never had enough time. I've always wanted to do so many things and never felt like I had enough time to do it. And I was always trying to get more and more things in a day. I desperately wanted my own horse. I remember my dad saying, well, you can't really have a horse until you can prove you can look after it. So he said, if you can get up every single day and go down to the farm and muck out the neighbor's horses, you can have a horse. And lo and behold, I did before school (laughs) through the winter. So he was um, probably a little bit annoyed about that and he had to fulfill his promise. But from as long as I remember, you know, I always was trying to fit lots of different things in. I always felt like, you know, people were not doing enough, we're not doing enough. Um, And so that's probably run over into where we are now I think we can often feel like I think there's so much that I want to do in life and we just don't seem to have enough hours in the day and days in the week because I 100% resonate and I know that the audience is going to be nodding their heads as well I vividly remember as a little child and it's it's really a, a weird vision standing at the gates looking at the people on the other side of the gate walking by wishing I could be out there and feeling like I was imprisoned <laughs> at school and had been slowed down or stopped in my desire yeah. to live my life it's so weird yeah even now I'm slightly over ambitious with how much I can fit in and I'm constantly reminded by my family that you know maybe I'm trying to do a bit too much and but I think the flip side of it is always then, you know, I get exhausted and then the world is ending. And oh, so. I guess it's that sort of mentality as well, isn't it? You do it now while you still can. Yeah. Time slips away, slips through your fingers, doesn't it? Tell us about your sort of epiphany or wake up call, if you like, when it came to time. What really helped you to see time differently? I guess time and energy are matched. You can feel like if you're not doing your purpose or or you're giving your energy and time to the wrong places, that can be very draining and can lead you to sort of burn out, can't it? Over the over the years of being an adult, you sort of realise maybe sometimes you're putting your time and energy into things that maybe are not not reciprocating. Started off thinking, oh, this is terrible. These people are taking the, the mickey out of me. You know, they're draining me. And then I think as I've got older and matured, you start to realise actually you're in charge of your energy. You you Mm. know where you draw your lines, really. Um, I think probably the the toys out the pram (laughs) moment and various things were, um, I got pneumonia a few years ago and that was a big thing. It took a long time to recover from. It was, you know, that was very, very draining. And I think that was sort of the start of, where you start to draw your lines in the sand and where your your boundaries are. 
maybe in not such a positive way, maybe in more of a kind of angry, negative way. Losing my dad as well was something that made me think like, right, you've got one life. And actually it doesn't go on forever. So let's just think about what you're doing. I've been working with um, a, a lovely lady who I keep my horses on her farm. Um, she's actually a business coach. Um, she also teaches me dressage, horse riding, but she's more than that. She's more of a spiritual mentor. <laughs> Oh. those things she has a PhD in business but yet she's a sort of spiritual mentor and she she's been helping me to kind of find purpose and and positively guide my energy where it's best reciprocated rather than being resentful about sort of Alison my mentor has helped me do it in a much more positive way and kind of shine light on sort of appreciating where you're appreciating where you're appreciated and appreciating what you do you know well and, and what comes naturally to you and kind of really understanding that your life really isn't about you know flogging yourself and working yourself into the ground it's about finding where your where your talents lie and then therefore where you sort of best um where your energy is really know, know what you're doing when you're procrastinating so for me uh, I don't mind doing the accounts I'm not brilliant at it um, it's fair enough. It's not. I don't hate it. I don't love it. But if I've got sort of a pile of you know invoices to sort out and you know an Excel spreadsheet, really, I just find myself just sloping off to do other things and saying, "Well, I really need to do Pilates now because I haven't done that today." Or actually, I really need to get that fence sorted out because I need to be outside. And she said, "Just take note of when you're procrastinating because that's where your purpose is." Um, and then the other thing I started doing was when your phone shows you the iPhone memories or whatever phone you have, the memories come up. Um, and, and actually, we found quite a lot of old photos when we were sorting out dad's stuff. And so that um, your life's purpose will kind of be woven into those memories. And when you start to look for it, it's like every picture of me in my childhood, I was stood with a horse or leaping around dancing on a stage. You know, it's sort of, um, you know, it was one or the other, or I had a dog with me that I was about to go off for a big walk with. And it was always about moving. Um, you know, I didn't sit still very long. And I think, and again, it's like in my later life, if I go through my university years, my college years, literally every photo is with a horse on the gallops, out on the beach with a dog or um you know dancing or something like that so and that's sort of I think when you start to realize that it's not kind of procrastinating isn't so much being naughty as you might have seen it you know, in the past it's kind of it's channeling that and, and sort of making it into something that people are going to benefit from I guess such an incredible reframe and yes around here when we're talking about procrastinating we're always talking about how it's actually productive procrastination in many cases because we're doing something that's leading to the thing. You have just segued us so brilliantly into the, the major reason that I wanted to have you on the show here today. For the benefit of the listeners, one of the biggest, biggest things that I have noticed in myself over the last few years and then more recently in the last couple of years is the incredible benefit of exercise for mental health. I know the word exercise can be a little bit charged, a little bit challenging, and people can say, I don't like exercise. So when I saw Esther was speaking about it in the way that I speak about it, I was mm -hmm. like, I need to get this woman on the show to talk about this subject from her experience, expertise. And over the next sort of 15, 20 minutes, break down the process so that you, the listener, can come away with the enthusiasm to just take your process to the next step. With that being said, the word that Esther uses when she talks about the mental health and the exercise is movement. Esther, movement is medicine. Talk to me about this at the top level and then let's unpack this conversation movement is medicine going back to the word exercise I uh, as somebody as I'm somebody who never sits still had all these horses and dogs and livestock and you know danced everywhere hated PE at school hated it would do anything to get out of PE and I remember my mum saying to me all the time you've got to, you've got to do it it's character building and I think oh, I've got lots of character I don't need to um and I always used to think it was a massive failure on the education system that you had somebody who would cycle to work with racehorses before school at the age of 14 cycle across the park in the dark before school 
um, you know, that keen on exercise or, or movement, but hated sport. What a failure. I always believed that the key to everything was exercising correctly. Left school knowing that I wouldn't really be able to sit down and apply myself to actually doing any academic study. I just was a bit too frenetic. Um, so I moved to Cheltenham and uh, rode racehorses as a job. Um, and again, absolutely loved it. Every morning I'd be up at 5.30, I'd be out the door on the gallops riding three or four horses and I loved this life. However, I did um, take a couple of falls and um, broke a few bones and thought to myself, oh, hang on, I'm actually, I'm not really good enough to be one of the top guys and um, I'm quite naturally academic, even though I find it difficult to sit down and uh, maybe I should do something a bit more useful. I got a job in the local hospital um, as a physiotherapy assistant and decided I wanted to become a physiotherapist. And then again, um, that's where it was about 20 years ago. It's in 2003, 2004. Um, and I think physiotherapy in the NHS was in, the, in a good way then. We used to be able to do a lot of exercise. We had a physio gym and it was really good. And it was doing things like I ran cardiac rehab um, and that was an exercise program for anyone who had had a heart condition. And in those days, you used to be able to come to the physio gym twice a week for three months and have a supervised exercise program. And was this, you know, and the thing I used to love about it was that it was not for really sporty people. It was people who kind of were not that well. And they used to turn up to the physio gym. And I think one of the things that used to really tickle me was that... Um, used to get gentlemen coming and they turn up to the physio gym in their shirt and tie you know because they wanted to look smart for physio <laughs> their exercise class and get all sweaty but it was seeing what an effect that had on their life so people would come in just really absolutely wrecked like they'd had heart surgery and they'd lost all their confidence they thought they were going to die um, you know, not in a good way. And we'd work through coming twice a week with the physios that were there doing this exercise program really simple you know nothing chaotic just sort of basic cardiovascular exercise and gentle weights and at the end of the six the three months um they were just saying things all the time like you know you've given me my life back you know I can go out with my grandchildren you know I, I'm not worried about running for a bus now I can go to work and um in those days I think you're allowed to receive gifts and our, our cardiac rehab department was just full of wine and flowers and chocolates all the time so that was how it sort of started in you know in some ways seeing how exercise can really it's not it's beyond sport and, and or movement I should say it's beyond sport it's sort of really helping people live again. With the physio that's what I'm hearing you say is that you're dealing with people after the effect but yes with the the mission that I'm on and the mission that I know you're on it's, it's how we can get people to integrate it right here right now so yeah Talk to me about movement is medicine in your own life, in your day to day. And we're going to come on to the question of, yeah, but Esther, I don't have time. If I tell them about my own story, people seem really inspired and it's only one person. The I don't have time is not an argument. So, um, OK, so in terms of I'm going to talk personally because uh, I can talk for ages about all of the clinical data. So my PhD was uh, in clinical trials looking at exercise for people with neurological conditions. And um, what I find, or I found working in practice over the years is I can quote all the data, I can quote all the research and it doesn't really mean anything to people. When I was riding a lot, I fell off quite a lot as you would do falling off young racehorses at speed. I smashed up my hip, broke my ankle, broke my arm, had surgery, blah, 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 blah. Um, and for years afterwards, I had a lot of pain. Uh, so even though I was a physio, I would have regular physio. Um, I, I taught, I've taught Pilates for sort of 15, 16, 17 years, you know, used to go circuit training, all the kind of things that you think you would do. And I still had this horrible searing hip pain and back pain. And I um, was genuinely quite worried that I was going to need a young hip replacement. So I'm, I'm 44, 45 this year. And I used to joke with the surgeon sort of half-heartedly and say, oh, I think you better put me on the list because when I get to the top, I'm going to need that hip replacing. Um, and it was always in the back of my mind, always had sciatic pain. Um, and then I decided to myself after my dad died that uh, I'm not getting ill. I've just decided I'm not getting ill. I'm not having cancer. I'm I'm not going to end up like dad, basically. Um, and took it really upon myself to almost design a program that was better suited to my body. So I stopped going circuit training um, and I stopped doing some of the heavier stuff. And I just literally decided I'm going to apply myself to doing a very 
true classical Pilates practice every day. I'm walking every day. I still ride um, and I still work. And I'm now completely pain free. I have no, I don't take any painkillers or any medication whatsoever. Um, I've got incredible stamina. I'm, you know, up first thing in the morning. I quite often finish teaching my last class at 7.30 at night. Um, you know, and then I've got my horses too and family and, you know, other commitments around that. So for me, it was really seeing how much you, how, what you can do, but actually how much you need to do. Everything you say, it's just <laughs> reconfirming everything I say, but how I also live my life I made a decision that I wasn't going to get ill again for the benefit of the audience there is a huge amount of science around the subconscious beliefs and subconscious reprogramming of your brain we've talked in the past about neuroscience and neuroplasticity and how what you tell yourself is what you believe here reiterating that this is what you've done this is how you do it thank you so so much for sharing that and let's just go into this Esther, I, I get it, I hear you, but I, I just don't have time. I hear it every single day in the clinic. Make a choice, carry on with that, you're the way you're going, or make time. If you wanted to, you would. I come across as the most unsympathetic person in the world, but the trouble is, is that it's true. You, 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 can't, you can't expect to get the results for something you're not doing. If you're not prioritizing your health and you're not prioritizing exercise and moving, you can't expect to gain the benefits from it. Um, so, yeah, I do come across as, as a little bit black and white on this one. And I think the other thing as well is that um, I have a very good friend who's a, a physiotherapist as well. She was in the military and she's an ultra endurance marathon runner. She's elite. Um, she runs for GB. She's a little bit older than me. She just she's just absolutely single minded, die hard. But what she said as she gets older she's learned that she really has to prioritize recovery. So she's never had a problem with running these huge distances. And, um, you know, she'll be doing 35 mile ultra marathons running in the mountains and the training that goes around that. But for her, she's had to learn to prioritize recovery. And she literally schedules two hour naps every day around life. So she trains, she'll have to run for however many hours in the morning, she'll do her strength training, but she's factoring into her day these naps. And when I first heard that, my first response was, well, we don't have, you know, who's got time to do that? And then the penny dropped and I was like, you make time, you prioritize. And she says to me, well, I don't socialize in the week. I'm very selfish. I don't do much at the weekend. She actually doesn't have kids. She works and she runs and that's what she does. And that is her focus. And that's why she's a GB elite athlete. It's about really where your priorities lie and what you want to achieve. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing it because I can say it a million times, but from somebody who sees the body, which is the consequence of not prioritizing it day in, day out, to then say, if you don't want, or almost, if you don't want to be my patient. The doors I'm very black and white. I... This for me, I think, is the thing. <laughs> How you look after yourself, you get yeah. the rewards. So if you want... If you're if you're farming and you want carrots, plant carrots. If you don't want carrots, don't plant yeah. carrots. I'm, I'm I'm terrible for analogy hopping, yeah, but that, yeah. I think that's a good one. Yeah, it's it's exactly right, and um, you know it goes back to you know I'm not saying I'm perfect in any way. Um, my best friend says that I'm incompetent at housework. <laughs> When she comes round, she says, look at the mess. And I'm like, yeah, but what would I rather do? Be clear, you know, again, that's my priority. Um, and maybe not, as I said, brilliant at you know, keeping on top of the accounts. I have to have someone in to do that for me. Um, you know, and obviously I probably earn a bit more if I did it all myself. But, but you know, again, it's those things. In, and what you know, I also used to have them um, when I was working a lot more, I'd have a cleaner because I just, I wasn't going to spend my time hoovering the stairs when I could be out doing something that was going to be very useful to me, as in I'd either be riding the horses or, um, you know, teaching Pilates or doing Pilates or, or walking the dogs. Or, you know. What I'm really hearing you saying and take away from this conversation is that you've identified what brings you joy, makes you yeah. happy and <laughs> makes you a good human to be around. Yeah, yeah. And you've also identified the things that don't and you understand how to negotiate and get your time back by allowing other people to do it for you. Um, understanding that the money buys the time, the money buys the experience, the money buys yeah, the feeling. And that's um, probably come from running a business for a long time is that you 
you know, I, you could work 24 hours a day. Um, and then you could be in a place where you have no family, and no support and, no, you know, no, no life and, you know, no social life. And I know for me, those things are really important. Having a clean house or, a you know, the house isn't filthy, but, you know, having <laughs> sometimes there's, you know, washing up stacks on the side and I haven't hoovered for a bit and there's piles of washing. But I just think, well, you know, is that important to me? Not that just important. Do it. If Just it, to put it into perspective, the Hoarder TV show isn't going to be knocking on your door tomorrow. <laughs> no, no. But also what I'll say to that is that's me. That's how I live. If it is important to you, you know, I'm not, there's no judgment. It's just, you know, if you are somebody who, you know, for you, you really value being a homemaker and you really like having things pristine and, you know, you like having, um, you know, you, you sort of have been a bit of a show home or whatever, and that's you, maybe you're an interior designer or something, and that's, that's absolutely fine. It's, it's just, I I have a small house and I'm rarely at home. <laughs> We're out a lot. So. And you reap what you sow, you get what you want from yeah. how you spend your time is what I'm hearing you say. Another friend of mine, she's a consultant dietitian. She works a lot with people who have problems, digestive pro problems, bowel problems. She gets a lot of people saying, you know, she's like, well, these are the options. You can do this with your diet and you can eliminate this and you can do that. And they're like, well, you know, is there not a tablet I can take? She's like, mm, no, no, these are the options. <laughs> like, I'm not going to magic up a solution. The, the, prob the solution to this is managing, you know, what you eat and when you eat it and this, that and the other. What I'm hearing really is this pragmatism. And as much as marketing would like to convince us there's a shortcut, there's a magic pill, there's a click your heels and, and it's just going to land on your head. The long and the short of it is you have to make a decision and make the decision that's the decision that's going to get you the result that it is that you want for the life that you want based on all of that. Yeah. Unfortunately, there isn't a shortcut. How have you designed your life? Just give us a sort of an overview of, of a week. Do you have a routine for the days? Do you have a way yeah. that you live your life, how you manage your time around everything? I do. I'm absolutely governed by routines. And um I probably sit somewhere on the spectrum because I once I'm out of routine, I'm all over the place. But uh, yeah, I very much have a weekly and monthly routine. Um, we have a clinic rotor. So I have um, three days in clinic a week where I'm seeing patients. I teach five Pilates classes a week. We have a rotor up at the farm for the horses. So I have my set days for doing that. Um, I have set times for exercise and for riding and, you know, I have set time for sort of family time and, you know, when we eat and stuff. So I'm, yeah, I am pretty rigid with time, probably actually to everyone's annoyance, I'd say. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not that flexible with it. <laughs> You're very aware of your time. You allocate it for the things that you want to do. Would you say that you, you're ever wasting it on anything or is that just something that you have been very methodical about identifying areas of waste and and I changing think what I tend to find is um what we're talking about always feeling like you never have enough time and trying to fit too many things and, and then I get a bit over ambitious and I think oh I'm just going to take this on and do that and then suddenly I'm crashed in a heap and um I do that thing which I hate <laughs> you don't want to admit to do you but I sit there with my phone is sort of scrolling through reels and and just you know and I think then you think oh my god I've just wasted an hour just looking at nothing on the internet and I haven't really even cooked a proper meal and I'm what I've done is just eat some toast and um and I think what it's going back to what my friend said uh Joe my, my running friend and she says she's really strict about allocating recovery time so that she uh you don't get to that stage and I think um I annoy myself when I do this. I'll turn up and um, uh, Alison will say to me, what's up, Esther? And I'll go, oh, just the usual. I'm just, you know, I'm just so tired from working so much and I haven't ridden the horses. And what's the point of having the horses if you never ride? And I don't want to, I couldn't bear to get rid of the horses. And Whoa. and then she sort of says to me, you know, do you need a circuit breaker? <laughs> do you need like a few days off? Oh, but yeah, so I can be a bit dramatic about things. So that's sort of why I'm quite strict about trying to, you know, and um, sometimes I think you sort of, if you have a personality type like me or, you know, but whoever you are, if you are one of those people who tends to sort of, you know, want to do more, want to do more, want to do more, want to do more, and then get very upset when you don't achieve, it's not necessarily that helpful for you. Thank you so much for the vulnerability to share that because I know that there will be listeners saying, 
I do that too. And just to, you know, band together, I also can find myself down a scrolling hole. <laughs> and I used to beat myself up about it until I listened to a neuroscientist's podcast, the, the Huberman Lab podcast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And even Professor Andrew Huberman says that he can find himself scrolling on his <laughs> phone yeah. because our phones have been designed to be addictive. My question for anybody is if we weren't decompressing, which is what I th I believe we're doing by mm -hmm. scrolling on our phone, if we weren't decompressing with our phone, what would the cave people, the cavemen, the cave women, what would the cave people have done? Yeah, well, they're probably just decompress. chilling out, aren't they? <laughs> they're sitting around the campfire. Been whittling, whittling sticks into spoons. Well, interestingly, actually, um, in the summer, I went away with, I took, I was going to do something in, in Surrey, and I took um, a, a young friend of mine who's, she's about 20 years younger than me. And um, so we were staying in a different friend's apartment. And I got to the evening and and I noticed that it get, we'd get to about 8.30 and she'd start just scrolling on her phone. And I actually said, well, I'm really glad you do that because it means I don't have to speak to you in the evening. <laughs> and it's sort of, you know, when you're really tired, we've been working all day, sort of being you know, up here. Um, and, you know, I think it sort of fulfills that part where actually you want to get to a part of the day where you don't really want to speak to anyone. You know, you've been nice being nice to people all day and sort of being your best self all day. You just want to shut down and not have to actually, you know, think about anything, don't you? That's it. Maybe they would have just rested and maybe that's the thing. And the the mobile phone, because they've been in our lives for sort of 20, 30 years now. Maybe the mobile phone has just filled a hole that there are other exercises that we could use. And or maybe it's not a bad thing to scroll and I mean, actually, yeah. we don't have a TV in the bedroom. We don't. We don't really have a TV now. I think it's. I guess the thing is, it's probably not a problem if you're doing it for an hour a day. It's when you have teenagers doing it for nine hours a day that creates the problem. Yeah, and and everybody needs to learn how to make you know a cheese wheel in an air fryer and, <laughs> and all these useful skills that we can learn from from the scroll. So you know, anyway, we're not here to talk about scrolling. We're here to talk about time and movement so movement is medicine then mm. what else are you doing with your time that you don't believe that other people are doing I have a very strict rule about this um I don't drive my car into town so I've got uh a, I know you live in London I live in um a, a small town on Dartmoor and um it takes me about 20 minutes to walk in maybe a bit less Parking would be horrendous because I've got um, a four by four because obviously I'm up and down to the farm. Um, but I have a, a rule that I never drive into town, I always walk into town. Now, my my Pilates studio is in town. So it means that I walk maybe sometimes twice a day in and out of town and I never park in town. If I, if I park anywhere, I go up town. And that's for me how I it sort of <laughs> partly justifies me having my whopping great four by four because I do use it it's not a Chelsea tractor I've, I've been through three floods this morning um and secondly it means that I'm get no I don't have a dog of my own it means I'm getting my steps in what are you working on this new year I can't even believe that we're in 2024 <laughs> what are you working on this year how can we find out more about it? Where is a good place to find you, et cetera, et cetera? I'm trying to work out how to live stream from my studio. So um, I can put all of my classes that I do via live stream. Um, so I did try and do a little bit on Zoom and I didn't, I, ha I haven't got it yet. I haven't clicked, I haven't mastered this yet. So I do a little bit on Zoom, have some pre-recorded sessions, but I want to try and set up in my Pilates studio, a camera that goes on to just me that's of a reasonable quality so that anyone anywhere can join in all my classes. Now I do classes for people who have health conditions you don't have to have um lots of them do I, I had this morning a lovely lady who's 80 she had two new knees she came to my pilates I had a lovely man who's uh, 82 he's been coming to me for 10 years but then tonight's class was is uh i've got a couple of squash players um you know a, a couple of half marathon runners so it will be a little bit tougher um but yeah so that's my that's my aim is to try and make what i do accessible to everybody rather than just local people for the benefit of people listening so esther does mat 
Pilates? I do mat Pilates for my studio. Um, so yeah, I do five, I probably have to add in a few more classes. They're getting a bit full classes a week of mat Pilates. And that's probably reasonably classical, but more maybe clinical Pilates, we'd call it, because I adapt everything for everyone who's injured. In the clinic, I do orthopedic work. So for people who have maybe broken bones, um, ruptured tendons, um, had surgery, knee, knee surgery, hip surgery, back surgery, anything. So basically anything from somebody who's been smashed up in a motorbike accident. Um, we're quite close to the coast. We do see quite a lot of military here too, right the way through to my, my, la my lovely lady who's 82 with new, two new knees. We do exercise programs from the clinic. And again, if I could live stream that too, or I could work a, find a way to work virtually, then I could see people who are, um, who are not, not local. But anybody who is listening to this episode who believes that they've got the answer to Esther's question <laughs> there or challenge for 2024, then reach out. All of the information is going to be in the show notes below this episode, whether you're listening to it on one of the streaming platforms or you're watching us on YouTube, you will be able to get in touch and we'll leave Esther's details as well so that you can find her and, and continue the conversations. Esther, thank you so, so much. I feel like we could have talked way, way more um, and have an amazing 2024. Thank you for sharing your insight and wisdom and for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. Till next time, my friends, stay safe, stay well, and remember, it's your time. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you loved what you heard, be sure to let me know by leaving a review so I can keep the good stuff coming. Come and say hi on Instagram at Success by Design Training or visit my website, successbydesigntraining.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. Just search Abigail Barnes. Until next time, don't forget, you are amazing and it's your time.